For the 13th consecutive Triple Crown race, we will not have the same horse winning two in a row. That's because Preakness winner early voting will not race this weekend. But one horse could come away with two classic victories this spring. After skipping the Preakness, 80 to 1 Kentucky Derby winner Rich Strike will try to win Saturday here in the Belmont Stakes. They will race for the 154th time in this classic, the 117th time, and the 55th year in a row here at Belmont Park on Long Island. This is the Ron Flatter Racing Pod pop up edition, hardcore handicappers. And we asked the question Will Rich Strike be favored, or will it be Mo Donegal, the fifth place finisher in the Kentucky Derby, who was the futures choice offshore? Or maybe We the People, who won the Peter Pan by open lengths here last month and was installed as the morning line favorite and is the Las Vegas favorite after Tuesday's draw. He got post one. Like last year, just eight horses tied for the smallest field since 2007. That was the last time, by the way, 2007, that a Philly won this race. And there's another one trying to do it Saturday, and that would be Mo Donegal's stable mate nest. We'll analyze the Philly and the seven Colts one by one with our hardcore handicappers here on this pop-up episode of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod. First, Mark Midland. Mark, uh, with you got the background there with uh, Belmont Park right behind you there, green screen and all. I, I, I have to ask you, though, before we bring it here to Belmont, do you have any lingering impressions from the Derby or the Preakness that you're carrying into the Belmont or just an overall feeling about this Triple Crown campaign? No, just, you know, from the, just some quick thought on the Preakness. I mean, the, the Derby was tough, right? I, oh, pretty much everybody missed that one. Uh, you know, on the Preakness, for me, I think I tried to get too cute. Uh, there were three top horses. I was trying to pick a couple and, and, and maybe leave your early voting in second. I think Ed said it well, if the price is right you know, definitely you take a horse that's going to be on the lead. So I thought, I think he had that right. And uh, I was trying to get cute with some of the, the couple of the long shots in, in fourth. And I ended up playing um, Skippy Log Stocking and uh, Happy Jack in fifth in the super high five, but did miss it because of uh, not using early voting on top. So that was a big, big, uh, big oof as the uh, kids say. But I will say, I did go back and listen. You did mention early voting. So if anybody was parsing it just the right way, they might have actually, they might have gotten the exact if they listened to you and, you know, boxed it just the right way. So, you know, it wasn't all for naught, even if you didn't take your advice on that particular angle of it all. But nevertheless, we turn to Sarah El Badwi. How about your Triple Crown thoughts so far, Sarah? Yeah, I think the pace setups were wildly different in the Kentucky Derby versus the Preakness. And with the way that the track was playing on Preakness Day, it seemed like for the most part, you wanted to be in the early flight of horses or sitting just off of it. And while I was mainly touting Epicenter prior to the race, it was kind of like calling an audible during that day and thinking that early voting was just going to be much more benefited with the way that the track was playing. I must defer, however, Sarah and Mark, because we should bow to the master from the Preakness. We save him for last because he was all over early voting. So maybe there is a chance for someone to win two classics in a row. He would be the man sitting, if you're watching, in front of a shot of Thistle Down. Do you call that your home track, Ed DeRosa? Absolutely. Well, yeah, no, grew, okay. grew up on it. Uh, right, well, explain yourself. Yeah explain myself growing up in Cleveland? No, no, sure. Uh, Let's, uh, this is a podcast. We can take this long. It started in 1979. Uh, <laughs> now, like Mark, um, you know, my thoughts were correct. Um, early voting on top on this podcast. And then I really got enamored with Skippy Longstocking and basically put all my wagers in the basket of him having to be in the, the top three to, you know, hopefully hit a home run uh, with early voting and epicenter. And those other two did their part finishing one, two, but uh, could, couldn't get the price in the mix. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, even, you know, knowing early voting was, and in retro, I mean, 5.7 to one, that was a case, like Sarah said, we're probably a, uh, an audible on my and would have made a lot of sense. I, I mean, the horse was an overlay and I missed an opportunity to zero in on that hunting bigger game with Skippy. 
Uh, I'll get another shot at Skippy here in the Belmont Stakes, and uh, obviously we'll get to him, so I won't uh, tip my hat too much, but uh, tip my hand, excuse me. But uh, yeah, it's been it's been a rough wagering Triple Crown so far, but uh, this is the get out race, and that's my plan. And I. And I just wanted to add, I mean, that's Sarah, that's a great adjustment to kind of call the audible, go with the way the track's playing, you know, and a lot of times uh, people get, you know, quote unquote, married to their selections and don't adjust, or sometimes people chase the track. I've been guilty of that and chasing the track at the wrong price, but to, to go with the flow of the way the track's running and then get five to one on an early boat. And that's, that's a good job. Well done. Thanks. It didn't work for uh, one of the races prior, but I'd rather be wrong about a favorite than uh, a five to yeah. one shot. Yeah. Good, <laughs> good call. And by the way, watching track conditions could be important this weekend, even as we are recording on midday Wednesday here at Belmont Park and you see everybody else in Louisville. It's a it's a balmy, muggy day today as we record it. It's supposed to be a wet one on Saturday, so we'll figure out how to factor that in as we look ahead. So we will go through the field as we always do on these pop-ups. The hardcore handicappers will go through them one by one from rail out after I tell you about this. This is just for you only if you consider yourself a smart horse player. Before you play the Belmont Stakes, you should compare notes with the Super Screener from Horse Racing Nation. Created by Mike Shuddy, it is a proven system backed by year after year of analysis and results. Knowing players have come to find out the super screener reveals what is important and what is not when you're handicapping the biggest races every week, like the Belmont Stakes. It reveals bad favorites and pretenders, and that means you instantly lower the cost of your wagers. At the same time, the super screener uncovers live long shots that you can use to boost payoffs up to 10 times. For Belmont Stakes 154, there is a special edition of the super screener. Normally priced at $99, you get it right now for just $39. That's right, only $39 to get exclusive insight and proprietary information that will optimize your picks on the Belmont Stakes. So why not find out what other smart horse players already know? Go to picks.horseracingnation.com. That's picks, P-I-C-K-S dot horseracingnation.com and check out the super screener. Ron Flatter at Belmont Park. This is where we pick up the action on Saturday for the 154th running of the Belmont Stakes. Post time is 6.46 p.m. Eastern, give or take whatever NBC might throw into the loop. Here's what the National Weather Service is throwing in. Sunny Friday, then showers starting overnight into Saturday, and then continuing mostly after mid-morning. Chance of precipitation 70% until it gets dark. The high will be around 73. So let me ask the, the group here first, just to give me a little thought about what happens to your handicapping if it rains. Mark, let me start with you. I think it's it's a little bit more about watching how the track plays. And uh, in terms of the Belmont, you know, I'm going to be looking for horses that are near the front and near the pace and probably avoiding the deep closers. And so in in a wet track, I'll probably avoid them even more. Ed? Uh, well, I'll definitely be looking at the HRN sire moves uh, to see what shows up for uh, off-track improvement off the top of my head. Uh, obviously, we the people who has the win over the track on an off-going and Constitution himself, uh, very gaudy numbers in that category. And I know that Ghost Sapper is uh, a name that pops up for uh, some off-going improvement, and he's the sire of Golden Glider, so that kind of counter- it uh, contradicts what uh, Mark said about the deep closers, but maybe the ghost zapper on top uh, can improve him at a big price, but uh, we'll let the stats tell the story in the Sire Moves report. Uh, something I'll look at to maybe bump up a horse into the super or try positions, but it, it won't affect my win standpoint. Yeah. I'll tell you, the uh, Sire Moves report will we'll have a one name that I'll mention here in a few minutes. Sarah, what about you in terms of whether we have a wet track? I think it's definitely a factor to consider. And I think like Mark and Ed said, it moves up certain horses. I don't really see it being much of a detriment to anyone in particular, um, but it, it, it doesn't change my finalized opinion. The, okay. the worst sire, I just looked at the, just the straight percentages 
Uh, Keen Ice is just 9% uh, Sire of Rich Strike. The rest of the field is all, I believe, at least 15. Um, so that, to me, is a noticeable difference. Okay. Well, let's dive into it now. And let's start with the rail horse, also the morning line favorite. That would be We the People, sired by Constitution, trained by Rodolphe Brisse, jockey Flavian Pratt won the Peter Pan on this track by 10 and a quarter lengths on May 14th. So he is one for one here at Belmont Park. His only loss in four starts was in the Arkansas Derby, and that was when he finished seventh off, only a three-week break. He was washed out that day. That's the maybe the ultimate draw line through it in terms of this horse's PPs. Bobby Flay, who will be on the pod on Friday, he bought into the partnership this week, led by Windstar Farm. Remember, he did this before, six years ago, when he bought in to the eventual Belmont winner creator. Constitution, by the way, Sire, is by Tappet. Tappet babies have four wins, one second and two thirds in the Belmont since 2014. Now that's a direct descendant, not a grandsire situation. Tappet winners include Tonalist, Creator, Taprit, and last year, Essential Quality, who was only, by the way, the fourth favorite to win in the last 25 runnings of the mile and a half Belmont. Two to one on the morning line, best price in Las Vegas, nine to four or two and a quarter to one. Ed, let's start with you as we dissect We the People. Yeah, this is a horse I'm just not excited to play at a short price, certainly is the favorite. And uh, when you look at the kind of the scope of the card, uh, I've heard a lot of chatter about uh, the short fields. And uh, I think some of the superstars earlier uh, are going to strut their stuff. So to me, like the Belmont is kind of maybe the, the lone opportunity to separate from the pack in any sort of way. Uh, Sarah had a really good idea on social media uh, about how to take advantage of some of the short fields. I'll let her talk about that later. But uh, to me, the opportunity looking either is the day, this 13 race extravaganza, or just the Belmont stakes in a vacuum there's no opportunity uh, with this horse as the favorite, or even if he's second or third choice at anything lower than three to one. Uh, it's just tough to get excited about. Yeah, the last race was fast. Yeah, it was on slop, which we might see, but fifth career start, the Arkansas Derby is a race I think you can kind of hang your hat on to go against at a short price. If this were a 12 horse field, and I love some prices and you know the Met Mile or the Manhattan, I'd be fine with being narrow here with some of the logicals because they are faster, admittedly. But given the way this day seems to, uh, the way I think it's going to go, I don't want to be alive to the favorite in Belmont. So I'm tossing him. Mm. Mark? Yeah, I'm kind of where leaning in where Ed is in that same camp. You know, two to one, I think some, I'm not criticizing the morning line. Uh, I think some people were surprised that it's probably a pretty good morning line, um, but it's just hard to take a horse like this at two to one. Um, you know, you mentioned the descendant of Tappet. Uh, Constitution does well at, at a distance. It does well in the slop. So that may be something to consider um, looking at those sire moves. Uh, he's probably one of the few move ups in the slop, like Ed talked about. Um, it's just hard, you know, to me, this horse has kind of had his own had his own way last time got out to an easy lead and just kind of cantered around uh admittedly that could happen here but as we've seen uh favorites haven't done well at, at the belmont as you mentioned speed horses have not done well at the belmont in the last 10 years really it's been only justified american pharaoh that were speed horses that that won so i just think there's a lot of things that are against it to take a short price here so I'm going to be looking elsewhere. You could certainly beat me. And I think that's just part of the game. You got to you know, go against these sometime. How about you, Sarah? Yeah, I agree with the crowd. I think we all acknowledge a lot of the reasons why people would want to use him and do like him and why he has been installed as the two to one morning line favorite. The early speed is dangerous. The victory over the surface on and off track is dangerous. The pedigree suggests that he'll appreciate a wet surface if that is what he gets on Belmont Day. To me, the biggest concern about him is the crowd because there was so much emphasis on being able to draw a line through the Arkansas Derby because he was overreacting to the atmosphere of the crowd. 
and the amount of schooling that was done with him afterwards in order to get him more well adjusted and better able to run his race on the track versus beforehand. Obviously that showed in the Peter Pan, but the Peter Pan crowd and the Belmont Stakes Day crowd are two very different mm. things. And so I think you have to be at least a little bit worried that if he can throw in an absolute clunker because he gets so rattled by a crowd, he's going to have to deal with that situation again. And do you really want to trust him at two to one? Mm. Any other thoughts, folks, on this horse that's going to try to maybe go gate to wire. If you throw out triple crown winners, the last horse to do that successfully was Datara in 2008. Any other thoughts about whether he can actually do that? It's interesting to me. Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely think given the field, gate to wire is out of the realm of possibility. But, you know, I would say it's another reason to maybe not take a short price. I do think it's funny year to year how things change because let's just say we had a horse going for the triple crown like at the center if this horse would be the sexy pick at six to one. Oh, went over the track. Look at the Peter Pan. He's coming in fresh. And now he's the two to one favorite. <clears throat> I don't want anything to do with him. but some years he'd be the wise guy for it. So it's a, it's a pass. Mm. Okay. Adds eight pounds since the Peter Pan adds three eighths of a mile adds a turn. It's not exactly the same race, is it? So Nevertheless, where there is the uh, possibility he will be the post-time favorite, Mark. You know, one other thing I would just add is, you know, we're kind of looking at this horse as the speed, and he, he I guess he does have more, more speed, and he's on the inside, but he's only been on the lead once, and his last race wasn't that fast. And I think you've got a couple in here. I mean, I, I could just be guessing, but, you know, with Skippy Longstocking and Golden Glider, that, you know, they may be looking to try something different. And... And if, if one of these, you know, if Mark Cassie says, well, go glider didn't run bad near the front in the bluegrass, let's just, let's just go. Let's see what happens. Let's not run behind we the people this time. You know, so I think there's some p potential there. I'm not trying to suggest a, a hot pace, but um, that we the people may not even be on the lead by himself. Now that That's a great point. Looking at the uh, free Bristnet PPs that we have available at Horse Racing Nation, Skippy Longstocking, Nest, and creative minister all have faster E1 and E2 pace ratings in their last right. race than we the people got. Now, again, I Mark said it best, that doesn't mean it's gonna be a speed duel, but it certainly means it's not gonna be we the people cantering to and front the whole way around. Someone's and gonna I, make I, a move. And, and I think that's the fear, right? That's the fear as a handicapper that I have, that probably a lot of us have is that it is we the people cantering around up by two lengths. Yeah, when we get to Barber Road, I mean, I, I've seen a lot of chatter, including from Jeff's uh, charting horse value uh, about what the upgrade with Rosario means. So, yeah, th this is far more compelling an early pace scenario than just we the people is going to be out there and, you know, 114 down the backstretch. Any final thoughts from you, Sarah, about we the people? No final thoughts. <laughs> I think everything's been said. All right. Well, we'll find out what's said from the betting public and find out if We the People winds up being that post-time favorite. Let's get to the number two horse and uh, a little more intrigue than you might think with Skippy Longstocking, sired by Exaggerator. This is the sire I was talking about in terms of a wet track. Trained by Safi Joseph Jr., Chalky Manny Franco takes over after Junior Alvarado is taken off. A maiden and allowance winner was fifth in the Preakness after finishing third in the Wood Memorial up the road at Aqueduct. He started four times the stakes races. That third place in the wood was the only time he hit the board. He's the most experienced horse in the field already with 10 starts, two wins a second, and two thirds. I mentioned Exaggerator, a curlin baby who ends up being the sire of Kippy, uh, Skippy Longstocking. Exaggerator started four times on wet tracks, won three, and finished second once. The three included the Delta Downs jackpot, the Preakness, and the Haskell. Okay, the only Preakness starter, by the way, to win the Belmont since a Fleet Alex in 2005 were the two Triple Crown horses, American Pharaoh and Justify. So on the one hand, you got maybe a horse made for the wet. On the other hand, Preakness horses don't always, well, they seldom do well in the Belmont stakes. 20 to one morning line, best price in Las Vegas, 25 to one. Mark, how are you going to distill this with Skippy Longstocking? You know, I went back and watched the Preakness and 
I thought this horse had a really tough wide trip and uh, um, I think it, you know, four or five wide and most of the first turn wide on the second turn kind of got in a little bit closer, but, and he just kind of kept hanging around, hanging around. And, you know, I think on one hand, that's a criticism that people will make of this horse on another way. I think that might be an asset and um, I'm not really looking at this horse for the exact or anything like that, but um, you know, I'm not a big fan of some of the bigger, deeper closers in the Belmont. And so if Rich Strike doesn't fire and Barbara Road doesn't fire, um, you know, I definitely could see a horse like this hanging around probably more for fourth. And uh, I think it's a little bit a test of the strength of the Preakness. You know, we'll, we'll find out how good that Preakness was when we see, you know, creative minister run back and, and, and Skippy Longstocking and see how they do. It just seems like there's no epicenters or early votings in here. So um, maybe a, a, a barely got fifth and the Preakness turns into a fourth or barely gets third in here. And, and I think at 20 to one, that's, that's, you know, he's the longest price on the board. So I think that's where you could actually make a few bucks um, if he can, certainly if he can hit fourth. Sarah? We talked about him quite a bit in the Preakness discussion. And my main concern with him was just that he wasn't good enough. And I still feel that way after the Preakness. He was never wider than Secret Oath or early voting early on. He did end up going wide to get out in the clear. But once he did get out in the clear, he didn't really do any running in there. And he finished ahead of Simplification, who bled. Armagnac, who set the pace and then backed up. And then Happy Jack, who was 14th in the Derby, and Fenwick, who was bet down because of everybody believing that a crazy long shot was going to do the same thing again, but really truly had no actual shot in that race. So the pedigree doesn't suggest that he moves up going longer. He uh, is by exaggerator, like you mentioned, who is 0 for 4 with horses to run over a mile and a quarter. His half sibling didn't win over a mile. The dam never won at all. So I just don't think that he is competitive in here and maybe he just kinds of runs along in a merry-go-round type of race and finishes fifth or fourth again but in uh exactas or trifectas i don't think he has a shot ed i definitely think he has a shot and i was thrilled to see 20 to 1 on the morning line my fair value is 12 i think so there's some opportunity there. Uh, I go back to the Wood Memorial. Um, you got a 107 brisnet speed rating in that. Certainly one of the faster lifetime figures of this group. Certainly among the fastest within their last two or three races. Uh, so to get 20 to 1 on that, one of the longest prices on the board uh, projected to be, I definitely have to use this horse liberally. Uh, I would say at you know, 10 or 12 to 1, it was kind of going to be a psychological use that I didn't want to get beat by a horse I liked at a price in the Preakness, but 20 to one, I absolutely uh, can use them. I do agree with Sarah that he had an opportunity to make a move and didn't, um, you know, it wasn't like, you know, at least the, the Oaks winner in the Preakness secret of she made her move that ended up not being good enough, but Skippy uh, Longstocking, you can't really say that about, that is a mild concern, but I think the 20 to one mitigates it. And uh, the horse I'm ultimately picking on top is coming out of the Wood Memorial. And uh, the horse I picked on top for the Derby uh, ended up not being very good at all and uh, didn't give me much of a thrill at 30 to one. But the third place finisher of that race did run well at a huge number. And the third place finisher of the race I'm picking to provide the winner of this one is Skippy Longstocking. So he is hmm. definitely going to be an A on my grid and a key to my verticals. Hmm. Wow. 25 to 1 in Vegas. Now, that's to win. So you're talking about this in the context, Ed, of longer I'm gonna odds. Get, to I'm going to get with you offline. I want to bet him at 25 to 1. I would absolutely yeah, he, bet him to win at 25 to you, 1. You know my apps don't work when I leave Nevada, right? <laughs> Yeah, but you didn't burn that many bridges, did you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, straight lines for 1,200, Mayim. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, so, Ed, you're saying there's a chance. I'm saying there's a chance. Okay. Mark, yeah. Sarah, you're what saying there's no chance. What if you shot me in the face? 
Uh, well, Mark, uh, you're not I, so you're not so off the Skippy long stocking bandwagon as Sarah is, are you? No, I, I'm just no. I'm thinking. I think she said it well. I think he ran fourth or fifth in the Preakness, but I think he could do the same thing here. So you know, just a question of it, you know, twenty to one could turn into thirty-five to one, and if not you have strong year. opinions on top, that could you know you know, it's only an eight horse field. And so I, I'm just looking at it as, can he beat Barbara Road? Well, yeah. Can he beat Golden Glider? Yes. Can he beat, you know, one of these, deep, a couple of these deep closers, maybe Modonigal and Rich Strike, maybe he beats one of those. And now is, you know, it, it's not going to be that hard for this horse to finish fourth at 35 to one. So that, that that's kind of my take on it. Sarah, you're just like, you're, you're sitting there going, yeah, you guys go look at that horse all you want, right? Well, I think it's a situation where you're really pressed to hunt for value and yes. that's kind of our job. And so yeah. I don't blame them for doing that. But I think that the hunt for a price sometimes leads you to horses that you would never like anyway. You just mm. like that they're 20 to one, 30 to one, whatever the price might be. And does he have a shot to finish fourth? Like Mark said, absolutely. He has no shot to win. That's the problem. He's not that's better than three, four of these horses that are in this field. He would need to run a race that we have never seen before from right. him. And for all the reasons we all mentioned, it doesn't seem like a mile and a half is going to make that difference for him. I don't understand not fast enough. He got a 107 in the wood, which is the fastest number of any of these horses except Mo Donegal and We the People. So what did Mo Donegal come back to do in the Derby? And who did he beat in the wood? And what have they come back to do? AP Secret was a joke in his I mean, next he beat, start. At he, beat the pre, he beat the Preakness winner in the wood. <laughs> Skippy it doesn't get better than that. Are you saying, you saying Mo Donegal beat the Preakness winner in the wood, right? He did, uh, yes. Okay, but uh, Skippy Longstocking yeah. hasn't proven that he belongs with that class of horses. He didn't He's, run in the Preakness to run better to prove that he is of that caliber. I mean, I'm, you're just going to make me dig in and pick the horse, I guess. I, um, to say he has no chance is mind-boggling to me. We already did this a couple weeks ago, and we can just repeat it if you want. <laughs> we can just replay it. <laughs> we can go back to the Breakness video and just play that clip again, and it'll be the same thing. Yeah. And how yeah, that he, was, he was disappointing that day, but I mean, I, I hear you. I didn't on bet the... back every loser I ever picked. I wouldn't be betting is probably a good thing but <laughs> and i hear you on the wood figure but i think you do have to keep in mind that you know mo donegal beat him by what three and a half that day and 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 convincingly so i think mo donegal's a better horse but one's yeah, gonna be no, 20 i know, to one not, I know you're not saying that one. it's just he does have to i think sarah's right that skippy would have to leapfrog several horses and do something that he hasn't done yet it's certainly possible and every price well they're all going to do something they haven't done it's a mile yeah. and a half race yeah no i mean and that's what i was trying to do with this horse is look at the you know the preakness figures aren't aren't bad and if you start to add points for the wide trip which i would do to secret oath or, or early voting i mean they were wide too but uh you know i think that's what was for me was getting him into the fourth spot but all right we probably spent too much time on this long shot right ron I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out whether I'm jumping on or on the, off this thing, depending on the rain. So, uh, you know, I, and look, if there's, if there's a lot of rain, I'm, I'm just going to keep looking that way, but I suspect I won't be the only one. That's the problem. All right. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and go to a horse. That's not going to be a long shot, but should she be, that would be nest the filly in the field, otherwise filled with Colts sired by Curlin trained by Todd Pletcher ridden by Jose Ortiz, Irad Ortiz, had the ride before, but he can't ride two horses in the same race. He'll be on Mo Donegal, the stable mate, and so Nest will be ridden by Jose. Second to Secret Oath in the Kentucky Oaks, of course. Uh, then Jose in the uh, Preakness rode the winner uh, in that particular effort for Chad Brown. And now you've got Nest, who's won four of her first five starts before she finished second to see uh, in the Kentucky Oaks. And that list of wins includes a grade one yes i know against phillies only but still the ashland is a grade one and she won it by eight and a quarter lengths the last philly to win the belmont stakes was trained by todd pletcher that was rags to riches in 2007 among the uh, horses that were also in that class that would be nest sire curlin eight to one morning line ten to one best price in las vegas both at caesars at william hill 
and at the West Gate. Sarah, let's start with you with Nest. This is the one I think that you would want if you want the pedigree that suggests that a mile and a half is going to move her up. Like you said, by Curlin, who was second in that Belmont to rags to riches, very, very high numbers with producing marathon runners and classic sires. He's produced Palace Malice, who won this race. And then the dam, Marion Ravenwood, she's one for one with marathoners, the full sibling idol having won the Santa Anita handicap. And she is by APND, who won the Belmont in the 92. So this is the one that makes a lot of sense getting more ground. However, this is her first time facing males, and it does have to concern you at least a little bit that she couldn't get by Secret Oath in the Kentucky Oaks while she saved ground and Secret Oath went wide. Secret Oath then comes back to run in the Preakness, and three males beat her in there, one of which is coming back in this race that finished ahead of her. So... I don't blame anybody for wanting to take a shot with her. She certainly makes sense as a horse that's going to be a bit of a price, but I think that not having won the Kentucky Oaks over a horse that then came back to not run as well in the Preakness, and obviously there was a trip in there and you can make some excuses for that effort, uh, not for me. All right, Ed? Uh, this is definitely very uh, price dependent in my mind. Eight to one, I would love. Uh, when I did my fair odds on Monday, I had her at nine to two, um, which eh, I might pump that up a little bit, maybe five to one more realistic or six to one from a fair odds standpoint. Uh, but regardless, eight to one then would definitely be value based on my assessment of her chances. I agree with Sarah, uh, the pedigree in my mind is brilliant for a Belmont stakes runner. Uh, you get AP and D on the bottom side, which uh, as a sire line, he has owned the Belmont Stakes recently, thanks to Tappet, who's by Pulpit. But on the top side with Curlin, you get a Mr. Prospector line. And he, uh, that line is, you know, just petered out with age. But from 95 to 2001, he won, his line was responsible for six of seven winners. They won every race from 03 to 06. Uh, they won every one from 09 to 2011. Uh, this is an extremely powerful Belmont Stakes sire line, and you get it here uh, through Curlin through with AP Indy on the bottom. So I think she's a huge move up with this distance. And as Mark alluded to earlier, she absolutely can be the one to make the first move on We the People. And given that her stable mate is a much deeper closer, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some instructions to that end anyway. Yeah. That makes her dangerous. She is absolutely a play for me at eight to one. All right, Mark. Yeah, I agree with that. I think she's very dangerous here and 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 also price dependent. I think eight to one is is a is a must play here. I, I don't think she'll be that high. And I would definitely use her, you know, in the five to one range. Um I I think there's a lot to like. Uh I think Sarah said this is this is the one with the pedigree as as both Sarah and Ed have said that has the most right to improve with the distance. Um, you know, Todd Pletcher's done well with pointing these horses sort of like you know Derby to 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 Belmont, and this is sort of the same thing. Oaks to Belmont. He he's been here with Rags to Riches, um, and and yeah, tactically, like Ed said, she's going to sit in a good spot and. Uh, she ran a good Oaks race. And, you know, the thing about the Oaks is that pace got hot. And, and so she moved and made an early move uh, when Secret Oath moved. And if you, you know, that second quarter of the uh, Oaks, they went, uh, so they went 22 and changed and then 46.51 uh, uh, for the half mile. And so she was already moving. And uh, so she's tactical and she can move. But my point was that uh, that was actually too late. So Secret Oath had already moved. Saez so made that middle move and, and took over the Oaks and won. And, but Ness never quit and chased her all the way home. And, uh, and so I think she's got, I think you have to upgrade that race a little bit. And I hear what you're saying, Sarah, about Secret Oath and the Preakness and stuff. But that, I don't know. I think that's kind of being a little bit uh, penalizing a little bit. Uh, I think if, you know, if Secret Oath got the trip up a center, got in the Oaks, not from a, Obviously, Opposite didn't get a great trip, but he saved a lot of ground compared to Secret Oath. So I don't think that their results are all that different. Um, so for, to me, 
every kind of different which way I look, where this horse sits, the pedigree, the price, uh, I, I think you've got to look at using Nest a lot. So I'm going to use her at all my exactas and, uh, and definitely in the win uh, in a lot of cases. The price dependent aspect of this 10 to one yeah. right now in Vegas. Do you jump on that knowing that if you jump on it now, you're getting 10 to one? I'm not sure. You're not getting anywhere near that on the day. No. I don't think because I think the public will come in and pound the betting on a Philly. I, I mean, that's my feeling about it. What do you guys think? I'd absolutely better at 10 to one. I'm going to have to get with you after this podcast and see if you can get a wager for me. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me just emphasize for any government officials watching that I do not condone the uh, violation of the wire fraud act. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. But then I'm going to say, well, in, in New York, you could ride. probably bet on uh, FanDuel racing or something like that, but yeah, I guess you won't be able to get fixed odds. Okay, Sarah. What about you, <laughs> Sarah? You got that. You got that look like a. You, you just swallowed the canary here. What? What's going on? You just can't believe that the, these horses we like. No, I can believe Nest. I, I much Nest makes so much more sense than Skippy Longstocking, and I, I'm not surprised whatsoever that either of you are interested in betting her. She has the pedigree to succeed here, and she's logical, and she's probably my second choice, but. We'll get to who I like the most in a little bit. Okay. You know, one other thing I wanted to add and curious if y'all had any thoughts on Nest here is, you know, I think the, uh, I mean, once she's very consistent, right? She's four for six, but the Ashland, you know, that was that wet fast track where that race kind of blew up and, uh, and it kind of dressed her up. I think that race was maybe a little bit better than, than made her look better than she is perhaps. Uh, but then in the Oaks, like I said, you know, I, I don't know that that worked out quite as well for her. Anyway, I have a hard time like getting a complete line exactly where she is, but th that's where it's like becomes price dependent. If you're getting, you know, six to one, seven to one, eight to one, it's an, it's sort of a no brainer to use. How much do you look at the Oaks and see how much there was in terms of gain behind secret oath or even with secret oath and think okay how would nest have fit into that you're, you're trying to to portray it in terms of how much she was going to close if the race had been another three eighths of a mile longer does nest completely make up the ground on secret oath what do you think it it's hard to say um you know i, I just my thought you know she's going to be sitting in a good spot here and you know, and back to the we the people, if one of these others decides to go with we the people, there's a couple horses on the front, they don't even have to be going fast. But if she's sitting her third or fourth, that's just going to be a beautiful spot to be in. All right, well, that brings us then to the Kentucky Derby winner. We haven't seen Rich strike in the afternoon since, of course, he had that 80 to one upset, the second longest shot ever to win the Kentucky Derby. He will wear saddle cloth number four. He is sired by Keen Ice. He is trained by Eric Reed, and he'll be ridden again by Sonny Leone. He was claimed for $30,000 by Reed for owner Rick Dawson off a 17 length maiden win in September. That's his only other win. He had a bullet 59 flat work on Memorial Day, covering five furlongs at Churchill Downs. In the current mile and a half configuration, though, and that dates to 1926. There were exceptions when they had to move the race to Aqueduct when they were rebuilding this place in the 60s. There was the exception of the COVID year when it was the one turn nine furlong race. But if you go to the 91 races done over this mile and a half right here at Belmont Park, only five of the 91 winners were more than two lengths behind at the top of the stretch. It would seem Rich Strike would uh, be looking at maybe doing or trying to do just that and become only the sixth in 92 tries. Seven to two morning line, you get him longer than five to one in Las Vegas. He was actually six to one at Circa and was bet down to 5.15 to one. So a little steam on him right now. Ed, what do you think? How pedantic will you allow me to be on your podcast? It's, hey, I, I censor no one. Uh, we actually saw him in the afternoon. His last workout it was between races at Churchill Downs when he got the bullet. It definitely seems as if some tied his turn on this horse, uh, whether, you know, maybe people are trying to be wise guys or what, but even the esteemed daily racing form 
turf writer Marcus Hirsch has espoused praise over uh, what he has seen this horse do at the mornings at Belmont Park. I'm concerned that his last time to work out will be, uh, you know, essentially 12 days out from a mile and a half race. I've seen some notations about slower gallops. I, I, I don't, I don't get it, but um, I mean, they won the Derby with them and we're willing to wait out the AE list. So, you know, clearly the, the trainer has, uh, you know, some mechanisms of turning the right screws on this horse. He's one, you know, to use the cliche again, which I'm going to use with creative minister as well. The price dependent comes into play, uh, but I'm pretty comfortable that the price is not going to be right under any circumstance on this horse in the Belmont. He's not a complete impossibility. And as we know, Mike Shuddy didn't think he was even in the Derby at the big odds. Right. And I certainly liked him a, a, a little bit more than a few others. I didn't think he was the least likely winner that the wind board indicated. And I don't think he's the least likely winner of this race either, but He's certainly going to get attention. He's certainly going to take more money than he should. The, uh, as you noted, the style is up against him. If it rains, I don't like the pedigree uh, for the mud. Uh, so there's just too much conspiring. And uh, that doesn't even mention the fact that this uh, will be, won't be Sonny Leone's first mount at Belmont because he has a, a few lined up throughout the weekend. But he's never ridden a race like this on a track like this too short a price, total toss for me, even in the trifectas. All right, Mark? Yeah, I, I think I've got to lean very similar to Ed. Uh, I think we know the price isn't going to be good. So uh, from a betting perspective, it's not, you know, it's a fun story. And if people want to bet them back and they're just, you know, betting $5, I'm, I'm not going to discourage them to bet them. But from a gambling standpoint, um, to me, he's a total toss out of the exacta and, uh, you know, he's working well. Okay. And, and I think he's a nicer horse than people realized. Right. And, and I think he could go on to do some, some decent things, but this is not the spot for him. We've talked to, you know, deep closers in the Belmont don't do well. Uh, people will bet horses that make big runs in the Derby. Uh, they think that the common sense would in indicate that further would be better. Right. And so, I think in the wind pool, he's going to be bet strongly, could even be favored. I wouldn't be surprised. So uh, there's just no value, and it's an underlay. Uh, Ed pointed out a lot of negatives with the jockey. And, uh, it, yeah, it's just one that, as a better, you, you just kind of have to be willing to say, okay, if, if for some reason he's really special and does this, that's fine, but I'm, I'm going to toss him and, and take advantage of that. Sarah? Sure. I tend to agree. There's just too many questions for him to answer in here. And it's he's so up against it in terms of race dynamics, the way that he was able to win the Kentucky Derby. He was aided by the complete pace collapse and the suicidal fractions early on. He got a great ride saving ground and weaving around through traffic while others went wide and for clear sailing. And Reed said yesterday while we were watching the post draw that they had attempted to get him to sit closer and make his run and it didn't work. Right. So that tells me that his trainer is thinking critically about how the pace is going to go in the Belmont Stakes and understands that it won't be anywhere near the same as it was in the Derby. So they tried to change his running style a little bit to see if they'd get the same kind of performance. And the answer was no. And so I think that you now know that this horse has to be closing from pretty much dead last or at least very far out of it. And I just don't really see that working out for him in here. Summer is tomorrow's not walking through that door, right? Hot Rod Charlie, who had the fastest first quarter in the history of this race last year, not walking through that door. But I wonder this, what if Nest engages we the people early? Could that help? Okay, maybe it helps Mo Donegal, which might be the object of that game, but does, does it also help Rich Strike? or? Or my drawing, as we used to say in Australia, too long a bow here. I don't You're think it would help enough. You think so, Ed? Oh, would you? Would you think, Sarah? I said it wouldn't help enough. I don't yeah. think that okay. they're going to cancel each other out that early on in the hopes of setting up for somebody else. I don't think they're going to push their horses through punishing fractions like what we saw in the Derby. And I think that we're not going to see anything less than twenty-three to the quarter. Yeah, I I think. 
you know, so we've kind of addressed this from a handicapping standpoint, but I think just very simply for like for, for newer fans, you know, it's hard to get out of your, you know, mind that how good he looked on Derby. Right. And the question is, well, how did he win? How did that happen? And, and like Sarah said, it was a punishing pace. And so very simply, there are 20 horses in the race. They went way too fast. And, and pretty much any of the horses in the top 10 or 12 were obliterated, so to speak. Right. And he was sitting basically dead last and the jockey got a perfect trip up the rail. And what's really interesting about horse racing, what makes it interesting every race every day is the best horse doesn't always win. And a lot of times in cases like this, you know, he, as Ed said, he's probably, he wasn't the 20th best, the worst horse, but he might've, now we might know he's, he was the 10th best horse in the race on Derby day. And he won because of what happened, but all those things aren't going to happen uh in the belmont on saturday there's going to be less pace so he'll have to work against that he's going to have to work against the track and all these other factors so that's where you know as a handicapper you can make money by interpreting what we've seen and and then kind of you know using that interpretation of how that's going to play out today and ed do you think i'm reaching here uh well i i just think and we we'll talk more about this with mo donegal and mark alluded to it with you know just the different ways races shape up and what it took for rich strike to win and you know world-class ride that should be talked about for generations from sunny leone into that collapsing pace uh he made the right moves twice to get out of the way of pace setters who were doing their horses who were in front of him that were moonwalking through the field if he gets stopped in any of those situations we're not having this conversation. Right. Mo Donegal went way wide. Uh, he broke from the rail, which I don't think really has been mentioned that much. And yeah, it's a new starting gate or whatever, but that probably wasn't the most ideal beginning. Now it's an eight horse field. There will be much less traffic regardless of what happens. And it, you know, it's his home track for Mo Donegal, his home circuit. So in my mind, even if things were to set up exactly the same in the derby from a pace standpoint and it's those two in the back of the pack if they're turning for home and they're both three to one win odds let's say i'm taking mo donegal every time at the same price so there's just nothing to recommend rich strike at this short of a price rich strike trying to pull off the win that could make him maybe could it make him the temperance hill 42 years later 42 years ago, Temperance Hill went into the Triple Crown and came here and was a long, the longest shot ever to win this race. And then he comes back and wins another grade one. Uh, anyway, winds up being the three-year-old Colt of the year after nobody thought he even belonged in the Triple Crown. So well, yeah, if Rich I'm Strike putting the cart way this, ahead of the horse, aren't I? Is that one in he black wins and white? This, he's he's the, the champion barring some unbelievable uh fall campaign that ends in a classic win with some other horse but i mean the the the, the precedent for dual classic winners to be champion and that frankly is why i'm a little surprised there aren't um other horses in this race because you know not that he's a likely winner but he's basically on my fair odds let's say nine to one he has a 10 percent chance of sealing up the championship on saturday isn't that and something if you have epicenter or early voting uh, in the barn, and now you've just seen your chance of winning an eclipse with, you know, easily among the better three-year-olds in the country, uh, I wouldn't be happy if I were an owner about that. Well, on that note, we'll take a look and see what Rich Strike ends up pulling in terms of numbers as far as the paramutuals are concerned. And if you're against him, you're going to hope there's a lot of money coming in for him Absolutely. obviously and maybe that's like maybe that's like saying the future lies ahead of us but in this particular case i think you draw a big circle around that all right so we've gone through the first half of the field we'll go through horses five through eight a couple of uh, short price horses and a couple of long shots yet to go if you want to improve your horse player intelligence hopefully we're helping you do that here but i also have something that you will want to try and if you've used it before i know you're already sold on it and i'm talking about the super screener from Horse Racing Nation. Mike Shuddy is going to be on our regular Friday episode of this podcast. You know he created the Super Screener. We're gonna go ahead and pick his brain to get some nuggets about what you might be able to find in it and maybe just entice you to go ahead and 
put down $39 to go ahead and buy. Yeah, only $39, by the way. I'll get to that in a moment. But the super screener is the result of years of analysis and results. Old races don't just fade away. They're part of the brains of the super screener. And if you're trying to figure out whether to spread or single a big race, whether to box or bet cold, whether to key one horse or another, the super screener sorts out what's important from what's not every week in the biggest races, gets rid of bad favorites, throws out pretenders, and uncovers live long shots. Isn't that the best way to improve your return on investment? Talk about returns. You can boost your payoffs up to 10 times. So why not try the super screener for the Belmont Stakes? There's a special edition just for Saturday's Classic, normally priced at $99. So you heard right earlier, yeah, only $39 to get the super screener, to get this insight and information that will optimize your Belmont picks like no one else. What was that old slogan? Try it. You'll like it. You will. Super screener. Go to picks.horseracingnation.com. That's where you'll find the super screener. It's right there when you log in. $39. That's all it costs. Picks. P I C K S. Dot horseracingnation.com. Uh, just, you know, Ed mentioned it earlier, but, you know, really kudos to Mike with super screener that, uh, he had Rich Strike as one of his two long shots for the Derby. And that's only two in a 20 horse field. And because of that horse, you know, it was really weird the way he drew in late after a lot of, you know, picks and sheets and a lot of us had done our handicapping. We actually emailed out to all the super screener buyers to say, add Rich Strike to every long shot uh, ticket and a long shot wager. So um, not that, you know, I'm not saying that he said to put it on top, but uh, did suggest to people to put Rich Strike in quite a few uh, spots, and a lot of, and we did have you know some good feedback where people kind of ad libbed on their own and actually hit the trifecta for seventy five hundred. So uh, really well done there. There's a lot of great information in the screener, and he's got one long shot for Belmont that uh, he's really excited about, and I don't want to give it away, but uh, it, he had some really interesting takes on on where he came up with this long shot. Interesting. Okay, so check out the super screener picks horseracingnation.com. As we continue from Belmont Park, where, yeah, there could be rain on Saturday, there could also be some other opportunities for you to play and win other than the Belmont Stakes. 13 races on the card. I know there's been a lot of social media traffic about short fields for this big car. It's too bad that the fields are short, and maybe that was some of the kinder, gentler way of phrasing it in terms of what we've seen on social media. But that doesn't mean opportunities are not there on the undercard. So you got Latruska against Malathot in the Ogden Phipps. You got Flightline making his 2022 debut in the Matt Mile. Jack Christopher trying to go four for four after racing in the Woody Stevens. Just some of the highlights. But let me ask the three of you if you've got anything on the undercard that you're looking to find and mine some gold for yourself. Mark? Uh, a couple things, you know, th there aren't many races with with deep fields, but uh, I do want to try to beat Lone Rock in the Brooklyn, and uh, I think there's a couple interesting ones in there. Uh, First Constitution, Warrant, uh, even locally owned to uh, 20 to 1 morning line has beaten Lone Rock before, so I think there's some interesting opportunities in the Brooklyn, and uh, that's that's probably the biggest one for me. Uh, I'm going to look at a couple prices in the Jiper. And uh, a lot of a lot of big, a lot of favorites, you know, that are going to be really, really bet down. How about you, Sarah? So I'll discuss this a little bit more in depth in a later video. But the structure of the sequence for the late pick five, or sorry, it's actually the mandatory payout pick five of the all the grade ones. There is also, in addition, another late pick five. But it really reminded me of Travers Day in 2021, where you had a lot of superstars, kind of like we're going to be seeing on Saturday, that were going off at short odds and not paying a lot. And the pick five that day for all of the graded stakes for a dollar paid 147.25, which isn't that much. But all of those horses, Yao Pan, Jackie's Warrior, Latruska, Gufo, Essential Quality, they were all pretty easy to come up with. In some of those legs, maybe you went two or three deep, but for the most part, logical. So the way that I would approach the sequence is I'm going to do a $5 base pick five, and on the dirt, in each of the dirt races, I'm going to single and then spread a little bit more in the turf races. 
So that's how I would kind of use these shorter prices to my advantage and try to make a little bit more of a profit that way. Hmm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, by okay. the way, for uh, Forensic Fire and Yalpon, I, every time I think of that day at the Travers, I think of the the savaging between Forensic Fire and Yalpon. I, <laughs> I, I, I forget about the money that could have been made there. And I saw your tweet uh, earlier about that, Sarah. So uh, good stuff. Ed? Uh, you know, this isn't overly clever, and I know you're not supposed to give out your strategy in contests, but uh, I'm I'm going to dive into the the Belmont Stakes Challenge, which is uh, five thousand with the thirty five hundred live bank roll, and uh, I'm I'm going all in on Flightline, who's going to be two to five. But in these type of contests, you get a little bit of a premium, and I'm going to have to have two other opinions. Be correct as, as Mark alerted me to. Uh, but I'm beside myself that there are people thinking that anyone but Flightline can win this race. I think he's the best horse we've seen since Go Sapper. I think he's the most naturally talented horse we've seen uh, probably since Rachel and Zenyatta, certainly. I'm very envious that you're there and get to see him. I think he's historically fast. If he loses, I will be in complete and utter shock and probably just not play the rest of the day. Uh, <laughs> I see this as a coronation, and I really just cannot believe that there are people who would rather bet Speaker's Corner at two to one than flight line at two to five. That's the, yeah, that, I was just going to bring that up, Ed. I mean, uh, they, I've certainly heard it coming here. If there's a buzz about any other horse in any other race, it is about can Speaker's Corner uh, beat flight line. Um, I'm with you. I don't see it, but uh, you know, I, well, we've been wrong before, right? Well, and I'm somewhat encouraged. I mean, I'm bucking some of the things I look at. Um, Brisnet's always software has them much closer in probability. Uh, Predictive form, which is another tool I see, has speakers corners the top contender over flight line. Maybe all these other, you know, data people and, you know, the CRWs will see it the same way and I'll actually get the morning line price of three to five. Uh, but I'm not a big eye test guy, as Sarah knows. I don't watch a lot of replays, but I have learned to trust my instincts when it comes on the extremes. And again, not that I'm telling anyone really anything they don't know at one to two, but this horse is truly special in my mind. And to think that Speaker's Corner remotely eats the same hay as this horse, I think is a, is complete folly. <laughs> I like it. I like He's it. eating magic uh, hay. Yeah, magic hay. Uh-oh. Hey, 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 hey. Watch <laughs> out now. All right, let's get back to the Belmont field. We gave you the first four. Let's give you the last four in terms of post position order. And that uh, the, the second half of the field, of course, begins then with number five, Creative Minister. Sired by Creative Cause, trained by Kenny McPeak, 20th anniversary, by the way, of Sarava, 70 to 1, winning this race, longest odds ever to do so here in this classic. Uh, the jockey, Brian Hernandez Jr., made an allowance winner this spring who finished third in the Preakness and did not start racing until March. His only two wins came with Lasix, but they also matched career high. Uh, he also did actually, though, off Lasix, match his career high Briz rating in the Preakness. So maybe not all about the Lasix uh, factor here. Other than 2020, by the way, other than the year 2020, which was the one turn COVID race, of the last 21 in the money Belmont horses, 17 of them had at least 27 days off between races. 12 of them were in the Kentucky Derby. That would seem to preclude creative minister. By the way, Tappet, we mentioned how Tappet's been so dominant in terms of his bloodlines. He's the damn sire in this case. Creative Minister, six to one morning line, best priced in Las Vegas at seven to one at the Circa and Westgate. Sarah, let's start with you on Creative Minister. So Mark said something earlier about how it's not always the best horse that wins the race. And that's kind of the perspective that I'm going with with Creative Minister because he is my top pick in here. I don't think that he's the best horse in this race, but I think that he gets the best trip of anybody else. I think that he sits right off of We the People in a stalking position. 
He's progressively improving. There's only three horses in this race that have a triple digit buyer speed figure, and he's one of them. And he did break his maiden on a sloppy track. So the weather's not really a problem for me. We kind of wondered if he fit class wise when he was going into the Preakness. And I know that's something we all were a bit concerned about, but I think his third place finish showed that he belongs within the topper echelon of the three-year-old Colts. And I do like, <clears throat> excuse me, that he did finish ahead of Secret Oath. And I know the trip wasn't great for her, but he at least showed that he can finish ahead of her. And that's why I ended up choosing him over Nest because Nest couldn't beat her kind of fair and square in the Kentucky Oaks. I just think that he's going to show up as getting the perfect setup in here. And if he's good enough, he gets exactly the right trip to show up a, a big effort. Ed? Uh, I'm not quite as bullish as Sarah and the, the price is a little, uh, why well, maybe I'm not six to one. I thought was a little light, uh, but maybe the wind pool isn't the place to play creative, uh, minister. But I do think with we, the people and rich strike certainly going to take more money than him. There is still opportunity, whether it's in the multi-race wagers, or if you beat two of the top three choices, I don't want creative minister to, to be the one to beat me if he's in the mix. So uh, I do think he's a player here. I, you know, I think I, my fair odds were eight or 10 to one. So it's not like it's, it's that big of an overlay at six to one, but uh, for all the things Sarah said about the trip, he's right there with nest for me in terms of, okay, we're acknowledging we, the people is going to be the one on the lead early barring some disaster from the rail but those two to me are the ones that can make first run. And I think that's super dangerous in this situation, that sort of second loan speed or second controlling speed, depending on what Nest does with creative minister. But yeah, he's, he's dangerous based on the way this race plots out. I just wish we were talking about eight or 10 to one instead of six. How about you, Mark? Ed, Ed's getting greedy. He wants the big, big price. Um, <laughs> yeah, none yeah, of us wants I agree. that. <laughs> I agree completely with what, what's been said. Uh, I think Sarah put it really well. Um, this horse is, is sitting, you know, he's going to get a good trip. He ran well in the Preakness. Uh, he ran, you know, a good third. There's no early voting or epicenter in here. And uh, may not, yeah, may not be the best horse overall, but I think this horse will be in a really good spot. And uh, I'm really between Creative Minister and maybe a slightly ahead of Nest and Mo Donegal as my top pick. Um, I'm a little concerned about the three races, you know, he's kind of run the triple crown schedule with a Derby day run and then Preakness and Belmont. And that hasn't really worked out too well in the past. So I, uh, if, you know, I'm not going to go crazy, uh, with this horse, but I, I think he can win. And, uh, you know, the last race, it, it was a good race. Uh, so I use time form speed figures a lot. He's got the best time form figure, uh, from the Preakness. So I think it's, like, that's why I was saying testing the strength of the, of the time form uh, or the, the Preakness figures as a whole. Um, and, uh, you know, in the last, he was kind of tired at the end, but I think he also kind of had a little bit of stamina and pedigree, just kind of kept going and he's got Tappet on the bottom. Uh, we know Tappet's done really well uh, as a sire in the uh, Belmont. So we'll see how he does as a damn sire. And, you know, so there's a lot of positives and six to one's a good price. And, uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah. So I'm kind of between creative minister and nest right now. And, and Modonigal would be my third, but uh, I don't know. I, I think there's a lot to like at six to one. A lot to like, except I keep coming back to the short break and the record of Preakness horses in the Belmont, especially recently, yeah. Sarah, Ed, what about, what do you guys think about that? That's his fifth start in three months that, you know, by today's standards is definitely an anomaly at best. And maybe, Maybe a detraction at worst, but he's going to be absolutely no worse than fourth choice. I actually think Nest is going to take more money than him. So that might make Agreed. fifth choice. And now Agreed. we're talking about the price I would even want versus, you know, like Mark and Sarah said, six to one is fine. So, hmm. okay. yeah, some some things you could point to. But, you know, unlike Rick Strike, you're going to get two, three times the price, even with detractions. Are you going to get greedy like Ed, Sarah? <laughs> like we're accusing Ed of being? Uh, not quite. Um, I think that 
obviously it has to be taken into consideration that he is coming in off short rest, but also he started his campaign so much later than a lot of these horses. So he isn't running every three weeks, every four weeks, like some of them where it might be starting to catch up to them now. He is, I think, even on the short rest in the past couple of weeks, he is an overall fresher horse, if that makes sense. Okay. Mark? Yeah, I just, I think he's just a use and, and, uh, you know, one of the top figures, I just don't think there's a reason to get cute. And then, you know, I'll talk about Modonigal more and when we get to him in a minute, but I just think the advantage of a nest and creative minister, perhaps sitting in a third or fourth kind of spot is going to be a lot better spot than Modonigal or Red Strike coming from further back. Well, let's go ahead and get to Modonigal now, number six. Number one, if you went to offshore betting before the draw, he was the favorite there. Uh, Not so now, but certainly he's not a long shot. He's sired by Uncle Mo, trained by Todd Pletcher, so that makes him then the stable mate with Nest. Jockey Erod Ortiz Jr. Remember last year, Erod didn't ride in this race because he got a wrist injury two days before. His brother Jose wound up taking his ride, started off hot, then finished fourth on known agenda. This horse has two grade two wins in the Remsen and in the Wood before finishing fifth in the Kentucky Derby in his last race. He made up 14 places and 14 lengths. He's had gait issues in five of his six starts. The one exception was the Wood Memorial. He is, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, fourth race coming up here at Belmont Park. He has a win, a third, and also one out of the money. He broke his maiden on this track going two turns. 14 of the last 26 Belmont winners did not have previous experience at the track. Back when horses raced more often, that was a big deal. There was once a stretch where I think it was 19 of 21 winners of the Belmont had a previous race on this track. Now it's barely half. Five to two morning line, also five to two in Las Vegas at the Westgate. Best price there. Ed, let's start with you with Mo Donegal. I think he's the most likely winner. And given that I don't really like the other two who figure to be among the top three choices, I expect some value to be there. Hopefully, I mean, five to two, I'm more excited about Skippy or Nest uh, at their prices, especially the ones you quoted in Las Vegas. But uh, Mo Donegal to me seems the one to be, and there aren't 19 other horses. He's going to have to go 10 wide around in this, in this race. One really interesting thing to me about, uh, again, referencing the Brisnet pace ratings, we sort of alluded to the early pace ratings with We the People and some of the others that actually can compete with that and even about faster than he did in his Gate to Wire win. Looking at the E2 and late pace ratings from the Kentucky Derby, the E2 rating for Mo Donegal is actually faster than his closing number. And Rich Strike was about the same, uh, which is... You know, people think they're making these moves in the stretch and that's when they're accelerating. No, they're making their move in the middle of the race and then they just happen to still be going a little faster even after deceleration than a lot of the front runners. And to me, that's a huge benefit here in the Belmont that Mo Donegal can make that middle move into a pace. He's going to have to, uh, you know, what pace there might be. Uh, that big sweeping turn into the into the straight and the Belmont actually does have the shortest stretch of the three triple crown races despite being the longest so I really like his style for this race obviously the trainer a well-known commodity with his three wins Uh, he has a nine furlong win as a two-year-old it just to me all adds up to him being the most likely winner five to two definitely my floor from a value perspective but he is the one horse of the three who are obviously going to take money uh, that I'm going to have on every ticket. Okay, Mark. Yeah, I, I I'm agree with that. And I think the way he just kind of summarized it there of, of the three that are going to take money for me, he's the one I'm most interested in. Um, you know, I think the Derby race with, you know, it was a wide trip. It was a bit of a bummer uh, for people that were kind of looking for more from Mo Donegal. Um, but I think if we kind of just back up going into the Derby, you know, I think this is a horse that we saw as a, most everyone saw as a grinder, rightfully so, that would do well in the Belmont, would do well at the longer distance, thought maybe even he wouldn't get enough pace in the Derby. Um, 
So, you know, I think Todd's had this uh, race in mind for him for a long time and, uh, and he's a grinder and he, you know, he can get in. Uh, I, I think he's extremely likely to hit the board, most likely horse in the race to hit the board, if not uh, hit the exacta. Um, but with the price and perhaps getting further back and perhaps a slow pace, I just, I'm concerned that there's a lot of things that he could have to have working against him. And so that's why I'm, my interest from a betting perspective is a little bit more on nest and creative minister uh, sitting a little closer to the pace than, than Mo Donegal. Yeah, that's my concern. Sarah, what about you? Yeah, this is a situation where I think you're looking at the best horse in the race that isn't going to get the trip. Right. And the fact that we've seen him come from so far out of it and he doesn't have a clear acceleration or closing kick, like Mark said, he is more of that grinding style and he needs a lot of things to be perfectly timed for him and go his way in order to be successful like he was in the wood. Obviously, I have no concerns about him handling the distance with the pedigree and the trainer. I think that he'll have the stamina to get it done, but I think it's just a concern of how early does he get started? Are those horses in front coming back to him? Is the ride timed perfectly enough that he gets there in time? And that's why I just wanted to go with horses that would be sitting a little bit closer to get the jump on him. Hmm. Are we concerned about the gate issues? Am I the only one concerned about the gate issues? I mean, I know because he's a closer, it's not as important as in it would Todd be we if trust. it's a front runner, right? <laughs> Todd, we trust. Yeah. In Todd, we trust. I mean, okay. You know, all that said, I mean, we were, you know, we've kind of gone back and forth at him. I, I think Sarah put it well that he's probably the best horse. Um, you know, and and like Ed said, if you can get five to two, that's that maybe that's the floor. But uh, I mean, I see this is a horse to use in the exacta. Uh, you know, and he certainly could win. And uh, I'll be playing him in the exact a lot with Nest and Creative Minister. And, uh, you know, if we go back to the wood, you know, he beat the Preakness winner in the wood. Um, so uh, he's obviously a, a considerable quality. This may be a little tea leaves for some too, but I definitely think it's interesting that Rapoli bought in and, you know, Pletcher's a salesman. And I mean that on the kinder side of the connotation of that word, but he's a trainer. I mean, you have to be able to sell. Uh, but I think his relationship with Mike definitely transcends that type of, you know, vibe that a trainer may have. And if Todd did not think Mike was getting a good deal buying into this horse, he would absolutely steer Mike away. Mike has plenty of options to choose from. And I saw that as a positive. And Todd even went so far as to make sure Mike got mentioned during the post draw yesterday, which I definitely thought was sort of an interesting, hmm. uh, you know, moment where you didn't really have to say that, but, you know, he wanted to make sure he included him. And I think he's, you know, I, I see that as a big, positive sign that Rapoli got into a horse that, um, you know, is by Uncle Mo. So there's that connection too. But uh, that, that I, I thought was a positive sign. That is, the, uh, handicapping the connections, as uh, Jenny Reese, our friend, used to say, Absolutely. that was something you'd, you'd end up trying to do sometimes, reading between the lines. That's interesting. But, but let me just counter that, Ed. Maybe, maybe it wasn't for this race, but maybe for something like the Travers that this horse was really being aimed for at the end of all of the conversation. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I don't think it was just because of the Belmont, but I also think it, it, it was t Todd has enough confidence that he greenlit the deal for Mike. Okay. All right. So that's the Mo Donegal story. Let's get to the uh, last two in the field and they're both long shots. We'll start with uh, the horse that uh, probably, I say this advisedly after the Preakness, will be the longest shot on the board. Number seven, Golden Glider, sired by Ghost Zapper, trained by Mark Cassie, ridden by Dylan Davis, was a distant second to We the People and the Peter Pan, and by distant I mean 10 and a quarter lengths. He's been in stakes company though, his last four starts was fifth in the Sam F. Davis, fourth in the Tampa Bay Derby, fourth in the Bluegrass, and then the Peter Pan. His only wins were in his debut, and in a follow-up allowance, both on Lasix. Off Lasix, he has been winless. 20 to one morning line, 35 to one at the Westgate. That's the best price you can get in Las Vegas on any horse in the pre. What is he at Mark, the Westgate? 35 to uh, 35. one. Okay. okay, all right. <laughs> Were you hoping I said 75? 
Of course I thought you said 25 and I was just going to be, I was about to run through the wall that he would be the same price as Skippy. Oh, no, no, no. 35. Uh, although there is a drop off with uh, two other casinos, but the Westgate far and away the best price in that case. Mark, let's start with you on Golden Glider. Um, you know, I think this is an interesting horse. Uh, you know, it's, it's a small field, so you, you've got to, you know, take a look at everybody. And I think, you know, just from facing cheaper, well, he's not really facing cheaper horses, but, um, you know, he really hasn't been competitive in this last four and the fact that he got distance in the Peter Pan and he's run fourth and fifth. So I, I think people may be too quick to throw him out. Um, I do think he has some ability to uh, to get the distance. Another one that's kind of hang around in a good spot in that fourth and fifth kind of spot or third. And, uh, or like I said, maybe, you know, they decide to turn the tables and, you know, send them to the front. So I think this is one that's a little interesting um, I, from that perspective, you know, I, again, probably more towards third. Um, you know, one, one way I would put it, like Sarah was talking about Skippy Longstocking, and I think she put it well, is we've kind of seen what we're getting with Skippy, and he's had a lot of races. So, you know, we can split hairs of, for me, that horse may be fourth. But um, this horse, I think, is still potentially improving. Um, you kind of have to throw out that Peter Pan because of the easy lead with We the People. Um, this horse has been on a off track the last three times. So mm. I think there's another unknown there. And then if we go back to the bluegrass, um, you know, he was kind of pressing the pace in a pretty decent pace, uh, close second before Zandon and, and Smile Happy ran by him at the end. And a lot of horses that have been kind of on the front at Keeneland and routes. Um, have come back to do well uh you know like again like in that what was it in the ashland you know nest looks so good closing and uh what was the horse interstate uh what's you know that uh was a speed presser horse and ashland came back looked really good at uh preakness interstate weekend. daydream what was it interstate daydream thank you um but i think that's it, the, the way the track played, it might have played a, a little bit against some of the speed uh, going around at Keeneland. So anyway, so I think there's some reasons to not dismiss this horse is the way I would put it. And, you know, I'd probably be looking more of uh, third and fourth, um, maybe even touch slightly in second. But I'm, I'm looking at like maybe a shot for third. as It's a, potentially a big price. Sarah. Yeah, this is another one kind of like Skippy that I just don't think he's good enough. And like Mark said, we've, we've seen him run against Stakes Company. He was on the Kentucky Derby Trail at Tampa in Florida. And I just don't know that I can take a horse that can't get by Classic Causeway, who would be a crazy price in here. And he doesn't have the same type of early speed to put him in the conversation as pressing we the people or maybe even in that second flight with nest and creative minister obviously if the instructions are different for this effort he does something totally um, off of what we saw in the last race that the outcome could be different but i think just from a class level he's a cup below some of the others in here head yeah i think i think they all said it the only Potential boost would be on an off track, which I mean, Mark mentioned with the, the good and was sealed in the Peter Pan when he was second. But, uh, you know, if it were really sloppy, uh, being by Go Sapper uh, out of an orientate mare, I, I think is interesting for him. But orientate, definitely a sprint influence. He was champion sprinter. His average wind distance of uh, the, the runners out of his daughter's. Uh, does not inspire too much confidence about a mile and a half here. Uh, probably an underlay actually at, at the morning line price of 20 to one. I would say he wouldn't be a complete and utter shock. I think he's a more likely winner of this race than summer is tomorrow or Fenwick were of their respective triple crown races, <laughs> but at, at 20 to one, I would just yeah. have to lose. And, and just to be clear, because he's been on off tracks the last three, I'd probably be, I think there's more wild card potential if he's on a dry track. If he's on an off track again, sure. yeah. then it's still more of the same. 
I mean, yeah. Sarah nailed it though with the the Florida preps. Those were absolutely dreadful. They didn't come back fast. The winner of the race, when stepping out against other competition, has looked downright awful. Um, it, it's just it's it's hard to hard to like, but you know maybe things fall apart or for whatever reason Dylan makes a a nifty move on the rest and gives them the slip. Uh, you know I can envision it, but I would need fifty to one. Yeah, and I don't think you're getting that if it rains. Uh, I mean, I think we won't no, be the only think, ones. I don't we'll think see. we're getting it no matter what, based on what we saw in the Preakness betting. Right. Uh, by the way, I was gifted. I was gifted this winter a Derby futures ticket on Golden Glider. I really? Someone. Yeah, I was. Right. So Some, you do somebody... have friends in Vegas still. <laughs> well, this friend actually wasn't in Vegas. Well, what uh, was in Vegas at the time doesn't live in Vegas. Got it. All right. That should boil it down. All right, we boil it down to the last of the eight horses in terms of post position. Where will he be in terms of the end of the race? That's Barber Road, number eight, sired by race day. Grand sire Tappet. There's that Tappet name again. Three horses with Tappet blood in this field. Trainer Johnny Ortiz, the jockey Joel Rosario, replacing Ray Gutierrez. Here's a horse that's been uh, with, let's see now, one, two, three, four, five, in the money seven times in a row before he finished sixth. At 60 to 1 in the Kentucky Derby, he made up 14 places and 15 lengths against that torrid pace. He was second to Cyberknife in the Arkansas Derby despite lugging in the stretch. As a two year old, he was two for four. As a three year old, he's 0 for five. I should note this. Uh, well, let me save that. I was going to mention something here uh, in terms of another factor, but I will save that after the discussion. Morning line 10 to 1, the Westgate best price in Vegas at 12 to 1 for Barber Road. Sarah? I think a lot of people are very quick to celebrate the jockey change. And I think that a lot of those same people were probably likely the ones ripping Joel apart for his ride on Epicenter in the Preakness. <laughs> and including a trainer. What is, <laughs> what is Joel supposed to do that Raylu Gutierrez hasn't already done? This horse has a very clear running style that he is kind of like a Mo Donegal. He just runs along for fifth, fourth, sixth, and catches a piece every single time. And while you have to respect the consistency, to me, the derby that he ran was very similar to the one that Mo Donegal ran. And I think we all think of Mo Donegal as the better horse because of what he did before that. And that's why a lot of people are willing to give him another chance. But Barber Road, his pedigree doesn't suggest that he'll improve but going this distance of a mile and a half. There's no marathon success on either side. And yes, he's taking the blinkers off. Maybe that translates to him sitting a little bit closer than he has in the past. And so maybe then he runs along for a third or a fourth. But again, another horse that I just don't think is good enough. Okay, Mark. Yeah, I, I can't find anything to like here I don't think his prior races were good enough and again you know the derby pace was so scorching that the the the, the bottom six horses four of the six ended up taking the the four of the top six spots um you know that's what should happen when you're you know 19th early and they go scorching you should make a run and he didn't have a lot of trouble he didn't do as well as rich strike he didn't have as much trouble as Modonigal. he ran sixth to me it's just kind of a yawner and now if we're looking at a slow pace uh or, or a moderate pace and closing in the belmont distance I, I i just find very little to like here uh ed before i get to you i should uh, mention the uh, in, in honor of hank goldberg who once told me this and standing in the uh, press box at pimlico after he made a big score he looked at me he goes flat blink is off always look and blink is off Blinkers off. I'm, I should mention that with Barber Road. Okay, so uh, with all that in mind, what do you think? Well, I, I was stunned to see, see the ten to one. Uh, I legitimately thought this horse would be twenty to one, yeah. uh, but there are people who like him. Uh, Sean Feld is a fan. Uh, charting horse value, I know, wants to give this horse a look. I don't see it. I mean, I think he's right there with Golden Glider, with the exception that. Harbor Road ran in the Derby and gets the rider upgrade. So I, I get the attention, I guess, and, and blinkers off to your point. But 10 to 1? Right. It's mm -hmm. probably the underlay of the field to be 
quite honest, uh, even more so than, you know, the, the, the top two choices that I don't love. But I'll bet we the people at two to one till the cows come home over at Barbara Road at 10. Uh, there's kind of similar to what, you know, I don't agree with Sarah on Skippy, but I do on uh, Golden Glider, what we've talked about. We kind of know who Barbara Road is at this point. He has no race that's fast enough to compete with half this field if they run even their median performance. I mean, I, I, I would hate to talk people off this horse if he were the price I thought he was going to be, 20 or 30 to 1. But at 10, I'm definitely wondering what the heck they're thinking. All right, I have one more pepper to throw in the gumbo on Barber Road, and for that matter, on Rich Strike and We the People. All right, I'm going to mention the dosage index. This could get some eyes oh, rolling. Right. Oh, my gosh. Uh, there we go. Here we go. I know, I know. If you don't know the dosage index, it is a measure. You're it's smart. complicated. <laughs> You're smart. It basically tells you whether a horse is more prone to be a speed horse or a stayer. It's based on bloodlines, things like Chef de Ross and all this. I will say this, 17 of the last 18 winners of the mile and a half Belmont had a dosage index of three or less. The higher your dosage, the more apt you're going to be to be more of a speed horse or a sprinting horse, I should say, not speed horse, than you are to be a stayer. Okay, so 17 of the last 18. The exception was American Pharaoh. This year, there are three horses in the field that have dosages of higher than three. So you would say throw them out based on history. They include Rich Strike at 3.36, Barber Road at 3.80, and We the People at 4.33. Now I was going to ask, would you scoff at this, but I've already been pre-scoffed. So go ahead and <laughs> scoff some more. Well, I mean, I would just say, and I didn't mention it because I'm just so amazed at the 10 to one. I don't like Barber Road breeding at all for the Belmont Stakes. I mean, yeah, he's by a son of Tappet, race day, absolutely a miler. And Southern Image, who I believe was by AP Indy uh, and was a solid handicap horse and stood at TaylorMade, but he has produced a bunch of daughters, or he sired a bunch of daughters who have produced milers as well. I don't see the 12 furlongs in Barber Road scope beyond all the other stuff we've talked about. So dosage does seem to line up, uh, but uh, that, that's just a coincidence because I'm not a dosage believer, but just the pedigree, uh, I, don't, I don't like it all for this race. All right, Mark, you were scoffing earlier, weren't you? Yeah, I don't have anything else to add to what Ed said. Sarah's the most polite of the bunch here. I, you know, were you scoffing? Well, in your mind she's she's blessed that she's young enough that doses <laughs> yeah that's never, right i just <laughs> it's never been in vogue in her handicapping yeah. lifetime so that's right sarah I this, is, this has cobwebs these cobwebs have cobwebs on them for the dosage <laughs> index uh let's say the most polite thing that i could say would be if this is something with 100 percent accuracy then it only buffers all of our opinions there you okay how there about that? All right. See, leave it to Sarah to crystallize our thoughts eloquently. All right. We'll come back. We'll get best uh, bets as far as the Belmont Stakes is concerned from our trio. I will tell you first, past performances heard on the Ron Platter Racing Pod are provided by Brisnet, the only place where you can find Kieran speed points, the easy way to map the pace in any race. Find out more for yourself at brisnet.com. A reminder, the regular episode of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod posts on Friday. We are hoping to round up Todd Pletcher, the trainer of Mo Donegal and Nest. We have rounded up Bobby Flay, the new owner of We the People. He'll be along to talk some also about Pizza Bianca, who he'll have at Royal Ascot next week. Maggie Wolf and Dale Morley provide some local flavor and insight. And the super screener himself, Mike Shutty, will provide some nuggets from that in his usual Friday spot before a big race. All ahead on the Friday episode of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod. And if you want to see what you've been hearing on this episode, the video of this Zoom call posts Thursday on the Horse Racing Nation page on YouTube. If you forget that, just go to YouTube, type in Hardcore Handicappers, and it will pop up. Time for the best play for the Belmont Stakes. We've kept you for so long. Let's get you to what we're coming right down oh, to, the, 
the best play. Sarah at Outrun the Odds on Twitter. Sarah Elbadwi, what is your top play for the Belmont Stakes? Um, if the price is right, which it looks like it will be, it would be a win bet on Creative Minister. He is my single in the pick five that I'm going to be playing as well. And then I would probably try to play some exactas with him and Nest, since I think those are the ones that are going to be sitting the right trip in here. All right. The man who's trying to make it two in a row in the classics. Well, at least we uh, we want to say that at EJXD2 yeah, on top. <laughs> on, top. Right, on top. I'm looking to make it one one in a row for my pocketbook. Uh, okay, I, yeah, I, I am Rosa. picking Mo Donegal to win, but the wagering will be uh, if he's three to one, he's a win bet for sure. But I don't think we'll get that. So I'm more preparing myself to play Skippy Longstocking and Nest as the key horses with Mo Donegal. And then I'm also going to mess around a little bit with if Mo Donegal finishes out of the top two. I do think that a Nest creative minister and uh, Skippy Longstocking exact a box is in play. So what I, what when I think those are my wagering strategies, basically what I do is box those three in the exacta, and then Mo Donegal is the key on top in the trifecta. All right. Mark Midland, you gave us uh, some really good superfecta advice last time. And I, look, I know they don't always hit, but you did include a couple of horses that would have been in the exacta. So you, got, you were you were there. You were in the neighborhood. So what do you got for us on the Belmont? Yeah. You know what they say about that. But I understand. I, here, I would just keep it simple. Um, exacta box. What's, you know, three, five, six, Nest, Creative Minister, and Mo Donegal. Um, hoping to get the prices in there of Nest and Creative Minister. And, uh, you know, I'm going to touch this Golden Glider a little bit in, in trifectas and okay. in third and fourth. I think, uh, you know, it's it's been a long time since the the preps of, of Florida, and I want to see what he can do going longer. All right. I normally do not like the horse who wins the Peter Pan and rolls into the Belmont because you got to add weight. You got to add distance. You got to add a turn. And that doesn't often translate. But in a Belmont stakes really lacking pace, I could see we the people becoming the first non triple crown horse to lead this thing from gate to wire since Tatara spoiled the big brown party 14 years ago. He's got that tap at blood too. And if it rains, if it rains, plug your ears, Sarah, I am not going to discount Skippy Longstocking, not with the exaggerator blood. All right, any final words? Uh, I'm impressed that the shortest field of the three triple crown races was our longest podcast. <laughs> I can cut out one of the hours of us just debating about Skippy. Yeah. No, no, are you kidding? That's, to that could that be a special out, make pop it up on the pop video. Up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we could we could sell that. Let's put that on picks.horseracingnation.com. Sell that for a little bit extra, Mark. <laughs> yeah, we de we definitely hit a record on length this time, but it was good. It was good. Good discussion. Oh no, no, no. You. Um, oh no, we had some in the Vegas days that were much longer than this. <laughs> Trust me. Oh yeah. No, I meant for this group. <laughs> for this group. Okay. Well, see, we were we were well armed and fueled. All right, so uh, I do want and to thank. Congratulations yeah. to you, Ron. Yeah, how's that? On the first class upgrade. That's right. When I flew here on Wednesday, not only did it take me fewer than 24 seconds to get through security in Louisville, but I got a free upgrade to first class. Jeez. I thought the, the trip can only get downhill from here, right? Yeah. Well, All you right. got just, King Umberto's to look forward to, too. Oh, good Lord. Don't now see, there's another podcast where I'm going to have to destroy you. But uh, no, no, no. I, I'm actually uh, I'm, I'm having dinner tonight with uh, Eric Reed, but not at King Umberto's. So I will enjoy. I'm, thank you very much. My thanks again to Sarah Elbadwi, Ed DeRosa, Mark Midland. Don't forget Friday, our regular episode coming from right here in New York with Bobby Flay. We're trying to line up Todd Pletcher. We have lined up Maggie Wolfendale Morley, who I'm late to get down to her office to record that. And Mike Shuddy will be there with all those nuggets from the super screeners. So until then, this is Ron Flatter. With this notice from the overnights here at Belmont Park, if the race in question overfills with horses of equal date preference, the order of preference shall be entry, run, scratch. Regardless of same owner ownership, 